Mihai, Casa Paleologu. Bine v-am regăsit ca în fiecare marți în emisiunea Metope. Astăzi am un invitat cu totul special. I have a very special guest. O să vorbesc în engleză. I will speak in English. Our guest today is Andreas Umlaund, whom I have known for I don't know him how many years. 17 years maybe. It was in the mid 20 2000 something. We met in Berlin at that time. I think you were moving to Kiev, or in any case, you were teaching in Kiev. Uh, you live in Kiev, Andreas Sumlaud uh, uh, lives uh, since, uh, I don't know when exactly, uh, maybe 17 years if I'm not wrong in, in Kiev. So now you are uh, in Kiev and uh, Andreas Sumlaud is a researcher and analyst at the Stockholm Center uh, of Eastern European uh, Studies. So thank you very much, Andreas, for accepting uh, my invitation. Uh, I think that uh, many people want to speak to you because you are a remarkable scholar uh, in the field of uh, Russian studies and Ukrainian studies. And also you live there. So you have uh, you are very precious for two reasons. You are there uh, and Uh, also, you have uh, studied uh, Russia and Ukraine as a, a topic uh, of uh, academic research. Yes, thanks, <clears throat> Theodor, for having me. I'm very happy to be on this program here for you after such a long acquaintance uh, or friendship that we have. So <clears throat> I'm honored to be here. Mm -hmm. So I, how is it to live in Kiev right now? What is the atmosphere? Um, I mean, we, we think all the time about you. I have to confess that every day in the morning when I wake up, the first thing I do is to um, see if something new has happened in uh, uh, Russia, in Ukraine, in the Donbass. Uh, we are following very closely uh, everything uh, that happens in Ukraine. And so please give us your impressions, your um, the atmosphere. Mm. Well, um, I guess one has to make a distinction here between eastern and southern Ukraine on the one side and uh, cities like Kiev or western Ukraine on the other, where I don't think there is an immediate um, threat to these um, central Ukrainian, western Ukrainian cities. But if I would be living in Mariupol or even, um, which is right on the contact line, or even in cities like um, Kharkiv or, the, or Dnipro, or Mikolaev, I would be much more nervous. Um, uh, the Kiev daily life is basically as as ever. Uh, there's very little uh, change, actually, um, although one can already feel the economic repercussions of the current ten tensions because um, investors, capital uh, companies are leaving um, Ukraine and um, Ukraine is already having significant um, economic problems because of that. So this is... a uh, already now um, problematic for Ukraine. Um, uh, but we are still hoping that there will be no military escalation and uh, or no major military escalation and that uh, perhaps with this sort of uh, recognition of these two, two pseudo states, the so-called People's Republics, um, you know, that we will stay at this at this level and will not see further um, uh, invasion. But now the Russian army can move in, uh, I mean, can move in officially. Uh, the, yes. the Russian army was already there, but now uh, it's a different situation. You know what uh, uh, the recognition happened yesterday when everybody was expecting this. Uh, what's next uh, from the Russian side and also from the Ukrainian side? Well, from the Ukrainian side, uh, I think that's a very short answer. The U Ukraine is, is preparing for defense, for defending the country. And uh, what will happen from the Russian side, um, that is, well, somebody perhaps to ask in Moscow. And, and my impression is actually that even many Moscow experts there, um, they don't know anymore. Uh, so the... Um, uh, the uh, The communication uh, is limited between the Kremlin and uh, civil society and media and the circle of people who are making decisions in um, in the Kremlin is very small. And so, um, you know, it's anybody's guess what will happen further. Um, there are various escalation scenarios. 
uh, for Eastern Ukraine, for Southern Ukraine, even for Northern Ukraine, because there are now large troops as well in Belarus. Um, and it's any, anybody's guess how far Putin will go. Um, and I think a lot will depend on how the West will uh, react to what has already happened and um, how credible the Western sort of threat of retail, retaliation, economic retaliation above all will be. But is uh, Putin not uh, expecting uh, a mistake on the Ukrainian side? I'm thinking of the scenario in uh, 2008 in Georgia. Um, mm. So waiting for a mistake in order to have a pretext for intervention. Is it a, I mean, plausible hypothesis? Yes, uh, perhaps he is hoping for um, a mistake from the Ukrainian side, but I think the, the Ukrainians, they are very cautious now. And um, um, that, you know, that is all the rhetoric that comes from the president, from the foreign minister, that, you know, we are not escalating, we are not provoking, we are not interested in, in military escalation. <clears throat> but um, Russia could, could, you know, launch some sort of false flag operation, uh, you know, they, they can always create uh, an incident, a casus belli, if they if they want to invade. So it's more it's more a question of whether they want to, whether they're ready to to bear the costs and the risks of an invasion. And <clears throat> I hope now that the actually the situation is now different from 2008 from Georgia, that um, the risks and costs are now uh, larger and that they are also assessed as larger in the Kremlin. Uh, <clears throat> the speech yesterday by Dmitry Medvedev, who was at this um, infamous uh, Security Council session, uh, seems to indicate that um, the uh, the risk assessment is not very uh, um, sort of serious so far in, in Russia, because he indicated um, that um, they are expecting a story similar to what happened in 2008 with Georgia, that there would be first critique and outrage and and so on but then eventually the west would get back to business as usual and if the west gives this impression um that the punishment will be limited or you know by time or by by range um then uh, indeed um i would expect an um an escalation but if the risk assessment is different in moscow then i would hope that uh, we can still avoid um, a larger military conf confrontation uh, but some of the declarations of Russian officials give the imp impression uh, that um, they have a profound contempt for the West. Uh, the West being uh, coward, um, undecided, uh, disunited, decadent, whatever. Uh, and maybe this contempt for the West is a, actually a great risk uh, in the sense that... Um, the Russian side may underestimate the willingness uh, of uh, the West to uh, to resist and to uh, take action. Uh, what do you think about this? And another important question is, is the West really united um, or enough or not enough? Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, that is the problem in a way that um, Russia may be both underestimating the Western resoluteness and unity and also the uh, the Ukrainian um, resoluteness and ability to defend itself. Um, in a way, I think something like that had actually happened in 2014 when there was this plan of a new Russia, Novorossiya, basically um, the dream of a um, conquering of uh, most of the uh, East Ukrainian and South Ukrainian lands that are defined as Novorossiya, as New Russia, which, not ha which did not happen. There were a few disturbances in, in Odessa, in, in Mykolaiv and other cities, but um, basically the, the Russian plan only worked in, in the Donbas, in in Donetsk and Luhansk, and even there, um, Russia had to actually insert their special um, units um, and um, irregular um, units, uh, fighters, uh, that were guided by Moscow. There's now research about the start of this pseudo-civil war by Russian agents uh, that were irregulars. There were, or many of them were irregulars. They were not actually employees of the Russian state, or at least not official em employees of the Russian state, but they were in, in constant contact with the Russian state. 
and therefore this uh, this war was um, from the beginning not not a civil war but a, a, a theater of a civil war if you like. But then uh, the uh, the Ukrainians got together and uh, and got their act together and then they actually uh, went into an offensive um, and then uh, Russia had to actually invade with regular troops in late August uh, 2014 to prevent a defeat of the irregular uh, forces it had in in uh, Ukraine and the same happened then again in February 2015. So um, there was already this sort of underestimation of the Ukrainian state, and now th that could happen again. That Russia may think of all of this as being too, too easy and too quick. Uh, but uh, this uh, view of Ukraine as being an artificial state was very obvious in uh, yesterday's uh, speech of President Putin. Uh, he said uh, basically that uh, Ukraine is completely artificial. It is a creation of Lenin. He said Lenin is the uh, author and the architect uh, of Ukraine, that Ukraine should change its name into uh, the Lenin Republic of uh, Ukraine. I mean, he gave a, le uh, a lecture uh, on history. Uh, by the way, um, I want to say that uh, Andreas Umland will give a lecture at Casa Paleologu uh, precisely on Putin's rewriting uh, of history. And Andreas, you have the, an excellent example uh, just uh, now. Uh, this speech, one hour speech, a long speech with a long uh, a part on, uh, on history, saying that basically Ukraine is completely artificial. Um, and it was um, uh, done, uh, created by Lenin. Then Stalin gave to Ukraine parts of Poland, Romania, and Hungary, which I find very interesting. I mean, it's a kind of uh, sign uh, uh, towards uh, Romania, Hungary, and Poland. Probably it will be more successful with uh, Viktor Orban. Uh, but I find it quite um, interesting. I mean, this uh, attempt to weaken. Uh, the front, uh, maybe in Romania, maybe in Poland, maybe in Hungary, some people will think, ah, that's the moment to take back some of our territories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, um, in a way he is right, but um, many countries of the world are sort of, in a, in, in a certain way, artificial. The borders are very new. Um, the territories belong to other countries. There were colonies of empires. They had only short periods of independence. Um, they did not have proper states for a long time. This is not nothing actually unusual. Um, you know, if if you if you think that through, then you could actually ask about many countries in the world. You know, whether they have a right to exist um, in their current borders, at least. Um, and that's the same with Ukraine. But Ukraine is an old cultural nation. It, it existed first in the Tsarist Empire, then in the Soviet Empire. And indeed, then the uh, the borders that were then um, also the borders of the new Ukrainian state that emerged in 1991 are somewhat artificial or accidental, if you like, as of all the other uh, Soviet republics, including also the Russian Federation. You know, and uh, because the, the the agreement was just in 1991 to not question these borders, although they, you know, these were Lenin's and Stalin's borders, and in that way, indeed, um, you know. Lenin could be said to, to be uh, responsible for the current Ukrainian borders, or, and, and even Stalin, you could argue, is, is uh, involved in that. Um, so it's a, you know, I think it's a, made an argument for people not very familiar with history, and this that these sort of discourses they are actually quite universal. There are, you know, you can find them in many countries where. You know, nationalists usually are unhappy with their country's borders and, and think that they should be actually much larger and that, you know, there has been so much historical injustice. And that is the, the standard argument also for uh, military aggression in, in history, you know, that there is something, um, some historical um, failure, error that needs to be corrected. And that's why this or that military invasion is allegedly um, uh, justified. Uh, uh, the viciousness of this uh, of this attack is indeed um, uh, surprising. It has something psychopathological almost. It's uh, you know, although you would think that uh, you know, the uh, as a Russian, there, there should be sympathy for uh, for the Ukrainians as a, as a close nation with you know, which is actually in many ways similar. The, the Ukrainians have a Cyrillic alphabet, also an Orthodox Church. They are Eastern Slavs. 
um, there's a, lots of commonality actually, but nevertheless, uh, enormous viciousness uh, on the side of um, of Putin and also of other Russian nationalists who simply don't want to see that there is actually a, a Ukrainian nation with a, with its own culture, its own literature, its own music, its own folklore, if its own uh, you know political traditions and philosophical thought and so on. It's just like any other nation in the world and. Um, um, and partly Putin has been successful in impressing uh, on Western on Western uh, observers that uh, that Ukraine is not a real nation or that, um, you know, because they don't know much about Ukraine and, and also they don't know much about the other uh, Soviet republics because their um, their na nationhood was suppressed both under the Tsarist and and uh, Soviet empires, and that's why they have now problems, so to say, to make them themselves be, be heard. I mean, Moldova, that you know, know of course, um, much better than me, is, is perhaps the prime example where, um, where Russia is already for 30 years um, undermining the um, integrity of the state, is sort of claiming that it has some sort of special rights there and is uh, financing and uh, supporting this, uh, this pseudo state in Transnistria. Well, so... Uh, by the way, Andreas, some of the agents uh, that have been at work uh, in the Donbass region came mm -hmm. from Transnistria. Yes. There are some yeah. GRU uh, officers uh, mm -hmm. who had been already uh, in Transnistria, so they have a very good experience yeah. with this kind of conflict. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that illustrates just that, you know, there's nothing unique here about the situation. You know, it's just a repetition of things that had earlier happened to Moldova, to um, to Georgia um, now we have this uh, new situation in Belarus for the last two two years. Um, it's the old imper imperial nation that does not want to um, to acknowledge that the empire is over. And that is also not something that that's unusual actually in world history. So um, I think we should be more in a comparative uh, perspective. Um, uh, uh, look on all of this and then much of this sort of Putinist rhetoric actually um, very easily is one can detect very easily these some sort of common traits of <clears throat> uh, neo-imperial or post-imperial thinking um, that one can also find in other time periods in other parts of the world where similar arguments have been made to to have some sort of revanche or revision uh, of, of borders. Uh, you said something very important, I think, about the Ukrainian nation, uh, the nationhood of uh, Ukraine. And, uh, indeed, many people, many people and many educated people uh, believe that there is no such a thing as a, as a Ukrainian nation. They say uh, Kiev is the origin of Russia. There is the uh, Kievan Russia. Uh, Russia Kievana uh, in Romanian. So, um, and it's hard to fight against these uh, preconceptions. Uh, uh, Kiev became part of the Russian emerging empire in 1654 after the revolt of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. 1654. Uh, so uh, the Kievan uh, Rus is in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century, beginning of the 13th century. So between the 13th century, early 13th century, and uh, the late uh, 17th century, there are um, several hundred, hundred years. I mean, it's a yes. completely different history. And many people believe there is no such thing as a Ukrainian nation, even important politicians. Um, uh, in the West. So I think that the speech of Putin has actually three different audiences. One internal audience for uh, the Russian nation, not to, to show how strong a man Putin is, a Ukrainian uh, audience, either to frighten uh, uh, the Ukrainians or to seduce uh, some of them, and equally a Western uh, audience, uh, people who, uh, like I said, have no idea whatsoever about uh, Ukrainian history uh, and who believe these kind of things. Yes, um, um, unfortunately, um, there is an audience for that, uh, which has a lot to do with the sort of uh, better marketing, one could argue, of um, of Russian culture um, under both the Tsarist and the, the Soviet empires and the suppression of the non-Russian nationalities in the empires, which, are, which have now become states. And um, that's why people, 
you know they they cannot they don't know what what Belarusian is or or Georgian and or um, or Ukrainian. Although you know if you if you live in the country, you see very clearly that there is you know something very distinct and uh, actually something very similar. Just that Ukraine is a nation as any other nation, you know, with with its own language, which is actually different, very different from from Russian. Uh, you know, it's it's maybe something uh, like uh, like German and, and Dutch. Um, you know, there are similarities, but there are also differences. And and then you you simply you know you you don't I don't even know what to say on this. You know, it's just an assertion that that is so flies so much against reality that you know that, you know if you if you don't want to see what is there, then you know you can't you can't help with that. And these this. Um, Quarrel around Kiev, it's um, it's odd. Uh, I mean, you know, the Russians are also an Eastern Slavic uh, nation, and and they have an Orthodox Church, and you know, and perhaps you, yeah, you can of course you can sort of link that somehow to the Kievan Rus, but but what does that mean? You know, that is uh, uh, that is that, that you cannot construct out of this uh, some sort of claim. Um, so um, I mean. Uh, the whole discussion is in a way ridiculous because these sort of modern understanding of nations, they are, of course, very young only. We we think, you know, there's this projection in the past that, you know, people like 500 years ago, they thought of, of, of themselves as Russians or Ukrainians or something. You know, the, people did not think in these ways uh, back then. This is just a projection. And then there are these 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 narratives that are actually fairy tales that tell a story that is simply not there because nations are a relatively young phenomenon in uh, in world history that uh, you know that most nations have only started to define themselves as as nations uh, within the 200 or uh, even at most 300 years so much of this is actually um, sort of um, uh, very uh, very strange yes projecting uh, the idea of nationality um before the year 1000 because uh, Vla vladimir was in the 19th uh, in the 9th century you know in it was uh, actually volodymyr it wasn't actually vladimir or, and <laughs> yeah. so and, and now there is this uh, uh, this uh, monument for volodymyr in in moscow and you know a, a swedish it's huge, um, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. i mean a swedish colleague meters. has told me actually that uh, you know oddly this is actually uh, you could argue that this is a swedish king because he, he was born in in kiev but he actually lived most of his life in sweden he's a viking and uh, so you know this and and, and there are now th these fairy tales about him and that th he's apparently you know sort of a forefather of, of of the current vladimir you know i mean this is just um, an avatar uh, an avatar yes. a reincarnation <laughs> yeah of the old Knez, the holy, the saint uh, Knez Vladimir. Um, but um, I, I want to ask another question about the prospects of Ukraine to join uh, NATO and the Ukrainian and the, the European Union, because there are uh, people in uh, NATO, in mostly in NATO, I would say, who rather avoid uh, the uh, prospect of having Ukraine in. Uh, there is, there was, and there is an opposition. So, what are the prospects? I mean, I understand Ukrainians want to be protected. We did the same. Uh, actually, we wanted uh, to join NATO. Uh, again, this is a completely uh, distorted perception uh, on the Russian side. The idea that uh, we have been conquered by the United States. Uh, the idea of NATO expansion did not come from Washington. It came from Prague and Warsaw. The first people who spoke about the extension of NATO were uh, Havel and Valesa. Uh, and then we also joined the, the movement. Uh, so I fully understand the desire of the Ukrainians to uh, join NATO in order to be protected against whom? Uh, it's quite obvious. Um, so, um, what are really the prospects? Because mm, many, I mean, many, some countries in Europe are rather reluctant. Well, uh, one can understand it. Now, I, I just want to maybe add another sort of element to this um, this mythology of NATO expansion that. 
um, at first, um, the uh, the desire of the East Central European countries uh, to enter NATO was rejected. Actually, um, the you know they came, uh, they were basically knocking at, at NATO's door, and NATO said, you know, there would be no uh, enlargement. And then there was actually the idea of creating a, a NATO number two, NATO bis, uh, in Eastern Europe, a sort of an East European NATO for all the countries that, as it looked in the early 1990s, would not be able to enter NATO because NATO was not yet ready to, to take them. And then it was actually a German politician, Volker Rühe, then the, um, if I remember that right, the, the defense minister of Germany, who then brought up the idea that, you know, for German interests, it would be good actually if Poland and the Czech Republic become NATO members because, you know, that would increase the security of Germany. So, and uh, so, and then, you know, and then it, it became slowly more popular than uh, the diasporas in, in, in the US. The Polish diaspora especially was very active in, in promoting the idea. That's that's how the, the, the NATO, NATO enlargement started, and not from somebody in Washington or in Brussels saying, now we need to, to, to enlarge our organization. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, Ukraine missed this train. Um, Ukraine should have, I think, in 1994, when it was uh, agreeing to give up its nuclear weapons, simply said, um, if we give up our nuclear weapons, we have to become NATO members. And then I think Ukraine would have entered because that was so so high then on the Western agenda to get rid of the um, nuclear weapons uh, uh, in 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 Ukraine, also in Belarus and Kazakhstan, that I think the, the West would have done almost anything to 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 you know to get rid of these weapons. Instead, Ukraine only got this infamous <clears throat> by now infamous Budapest Memorandum, where uh, you know with the, with these so-called security assurances or security guarantees, which is not, however, a military alliance. You know, Britain and the U.S. are signatories of this memorandum, and uh, but it's it's not a, a mutual aid pact. It's just a a confirmation that these countries, um, including Russia, would not attack Ukraine or exert pressure on Ukraine. Russia has now broken um, this promise from 1994, has thereby under, been undermining the nuclear non-proliferation regime. But Ukraine has no claim uh, of a mutual uh, or of military assistance from, from Britain or from the US on the basis of the Budapest Memorandum. Well, and then when Ukraine came uh, with the idea um, and applied in 2008 um, for, uh, together with Georgia for um, membership, then it was too late. Um, then uh, already, um, especially the West European countries were fearing um, Russia and they didn't want to uh, enrage Putin, who had in 2007 given his infamous uh, speech at the Munich uh, conference. And so um, then uh, Ukraine got this, uh, and Georgia, they got this odd uh, membership uh, promise in the Bucharest uh, Declaration from 2008, but no, no membership action plan or no specification when and how actually these countries would enter NATO. And now I'm, I'm afraid what I'm telling Ukrainians usually quite openly and very frankly and frustratingly is that <laughs> Ukraine may only become a NATO member when it does not need NATO anymore. So that is um, um, unfortunately what I, I'm afraid will happen. Can Once you, the conflict... Hmm? Can you elaborate a little bit more? What does it mean? Well, um, Ukraine needs uh, the um, needs NATO above all for protection against Russia and because of the conflict now. Uh, and once the conflict is resolved and, you know, Russia has become uh, a normal nation state without imperial uh, ambition towards... When? Uh, when? Yeah, well, I don't know when, but uh, one day I think it will happen. And then Ukraine will become a member of NATO, but then it won't need it that much anymore. So, um, so that, that's the odd situation in which now Ukraine has found itself. I'm, I'm afraid the same goes for Georgia. Mm -hmm. So you're, uh, you say basically that the prospects are very low. Uh, Even without this whole escalation now and Putin's desires, as long as there is this conflict with Russia, uh, there will be always some of the 30 countries, member countries, and all of them have to agree that will uh, will not want to, to enter this conflict. And what about EU membership then? That's a different story, and that's also what I'm trying to say, Ukrainians, that um, the EU is formally also a defense unity, uh, um, uh, a defense union, 
Now, um, it has a special article that is very similar, actually, to the Washington uh, Treaty Article Number 5, which is about mutual aid, military aid. But it's not it's not a military alliance. So um, uh, so the EU is a very different animal, actually. And I think there um, Ukraine has has better chances to enter and it should get the membership perspective. And it would also be uh, for much more difficult for for the Kremlin to argue against an EU membership uh, of countries like um Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, because you could then not construct easily some sort of existential geopolitical threat for Russia, because of the European Union is not a is not a military uh, sort of uh, organization. So um, I think that that's actually the way to go. And uh, yes, yes, Andreas, but the the conflict in 2013 started with uh, yeah. uh, over actually over the issue of uh, association with the, the European Union. That's how everything started in November 2013, when uh, Yanukovych uh, gave up on uh, uh, signing the, uh, the the treaty, the agreement. Yes. Yeah, and um, uh, the EU is here a threat to the current Russian regime because of its values, because of the uh, democracy promotion that it is engaged in, promotion of rule of law and so on. And this is all for the current regime a threat, but it, you know, and, and that's why... Uh, uh, Russia is against this and has also, for instance, forbidden uh, uh, Armenia, its ally, to sign an association agreement, a uh, full-scale association agreement with with, um, uh, with the European Union. And Armenia was for a while engaged in the same negotiations as uh, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine uh, for a similar uh, large um, association agreement. But then in September 2013, then George, uh, Armenian President Saksyan met, met, met Putin and then came out and said, we, we will enter the Eurasian Economic Union, which then meant that, then meant that um, Armenia would not get an association agreement with the, um, with the uh, European Union. They now got an extended cooperation agreement, but it has a different uh, sort of meaning than the association agreements of Moldova, Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, I have. A, we have to take a break uh, for publicity, and then uh, we finish our discussion. Okay. Vine, vine primavara. Se așterne în toată țara și în casa ta. Primavara, da, cu flori și căldură, dar fără puf, praf sau murdărie. Pentru că acum cureți și dezinfectezi toate tipurile de suprafețe dure cu Kerher. De la podea la hotă, cuptor, geamuri, oglinzi, rosturi, obiecte sanitare sau chiar jucăriile copiilor rătăcite pe sub canapea. Da, cu un singur aparat de curățat cu aburi de la Kerher. Fără substanțe chimice, fără mirosuri puternice, cu puterea și temperatura aburului. La cald și bine și curat. În gherila de dimineață, spune-ne cu ce ai începe curățenia de primă vara vieții tale și Kerher te premiază. Kerher, curățenia de primăvară niciodată mai ușoară. Acum ai mai mult gust autentic mec cu un meniu din partea noastră. Cumpără 3 meniuri maxi și primești încă unul din partea noastră. Ofertă valabilă în perioada 16 februarie-16 martie. Doar la McDrive. Ce anume se poate realiza pe o suprafață de 110 metri pătrați construiți? Se poate amenaja o locuință, un magazin, o farmacie sau poate funcționa o uzină. O uzină care produce ser de concerte live în miros de cafea prăjită peste zi. Uzina Coffee din Amzei 5. Uzina care produce timp de calitate. Timpul tău. E bine să-ți rezervi un loc din vreme. Un spațiu mic pus pe evenimente mari. Pentru tine. În Amzei 5. Uzina Coffee este avampost Radio Gheri. Metope. Emisiune realizată prin amabilitatea fundației Casa Paleologu. Uh, we are back for the last uh, minutes of our discussion. Uh, Andreas, um, we, we're speaking about oppositions in uh, the West, uh, in the Western countries, uh, towards uh, an accession to uh, NATO uh, of Ukraine. Um, I'm following, you know, very closely the French elections, for instance, no? the, the French politics in general. And um, I see that, uh, okay, Macron tried uh, to play a, a role as a negotiator. That's very nice. I mean, it's a very good uh, uh, 
um, project. But we have to remember that Macron himself has said about NATO that is uh, en mort cerebral, almost dead. I don't know how to say in English, but uh, uh, cerebral death. No, so it's, it's a very strong statement. Uh, our, uh, among the most important uh, candidates in the French elections, you have uh, Mélenchon, uh, Zemmour and uh, Marine Le Pen uh, saying that uh, France should leave NATO or at least the military organization. So that's what Zemmour says. Mélenchon says we should leave it all together. Uh, so you have uh, at least 45 percent uh, of the, I mean, more over 40 percent of the people uh, who are attracted by people who um, say these kind of things. Uh, so, I mean, it's quite uh, problematic. I mean, it's one of the most important countries in uh, in the alliance. Uh, maybe uh, the same is true to a lesser degree in other uh, countries of uh, Europe, in, Fr in Italy, uh, in Austria, in Germany as well, uh, either, either on the left or the right. So this is um, quite uh, um, worrying. Yes, I'm also worried by that. Um, still, I think, you know, there's there's usually more talk than than action. We had already uh, a phase when when France was not part of the military organization, so it wouldn't actually change that much. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, so I'm I'm not that worried about the the problem here for Ukraine is simply that uh, it's uh, now. Andreas, wait a second. I uh, in principle, I would say the same. Okay, Zemmour says that uh, uh, France should go out of uh, the military organization of NATO, as Le General de Gaulle has done in the 60s. Fine. Uh, but the timing is not <laughs> ideal. I mean, we are in a, in a major uh, crisis, in the middle of a major crisis, uh, the Ukrainian crisis, and uh, we hear someone saying that uh, France should leave the military organization. Maybe in principle... We can, I mean, agree or disagree, whatever. It's it's a debatable issue, but the timing is disastrous. It gives a very bad sign, I would say. No? Yes, I agree. But, you know, I'm, I, I've encountered that many times also in Germany that simply the threat perception and the crisis perception is in Western Europe, at least in continental Western Europe, very different from, uh, from Eastern Europe. And, you know, there's a different geopolitical thinking and uh, <clears throat> I'm now working for a Swedish think tank, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised how um, sort of realistic uh, the Swedes are thinking about world politics. Sweden is not a member of, of, of NATO, but it's, uh, you know, it has a very clear, clear uh, sort of and view. Are they, of, going, are they going to join, join in NATO? <laughs> It could happen. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a topic in, in Sweden. It's not a... It's not a trivial issue. It's not a joke. And um, there have been waves of uh, discussion of this. And now there is perhaps a new wave with this um, Russian claim that uh, Finland and Sweden should not enter, <clears throat> enter NATO. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, in Western Europe, especially in countries like Germany and Italy and France and, and also the Netherlands and so on, you know, there is a perception that, you know, what's happening in Eastern Europe is far away. It's, you know, all these, you know, strange peoples there. Okay, with a, how, can, you know. how can we counter this kind of perception? What are the arguments? Because I also know people like this. What should I tell them? What should we tell them? Well, one argument that I'm often sort of proposing is the importance. We've already talked about it of the... Uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict for the nuclear non-proliferation regime because it puts the whole logic of this uh, fundamental um, agreement of humanity. It's one of the, I would say, most important treaties that you, that the world has the uh, not about the non-proliferation of nucle nuclear weapons. It puts the logic on its head because Russia has been doing what it has been doing because it has nuclear weapons and it is explicitly allowed to have nuclear weapons. And what has happened to Ukraine has happened because Ukraine does not have nuclear weapons. And moreover, nuclear is 
um, uh, Ukraine is forbidden to have nuclear weapons. And surprise, surprise, a nuclear weapons state under the non-proliferation regime increases uh, the territory at the expense of a non-nuclear weapons state. And even more so, U Ukraine once had a, a nuclear arsenal that it, it gave up. And uh, in um, naively believing in, in the validity of the nuclear non-proliferation regime, that actually foresees um, that uh, the non-nuclear weapon state would be protected by, um, would be protected from the nuclear weapon states. And if you have this situation, then this, this may have large repercussions across the world, because there may be many political leaders who will be looking on, on Ukraine and will be looking on Russia, and they will be thinking, we are not going to be as stupid as the Ukrainians. Instead, we're going to be as smart as the Russians. And we and are North not Korea. going to use... And yeah. North Korea is a good example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The North Koreans are very smart people, you know. And so, um, and maybe we will, we may actually be as smart as the Russians and can actually increase our territory, you know, as the Russians did, just, you know, snatching from a weaker country quickly when, when the opportunity arises, um, a prime piece of land and, and then saying, you know, whoever interferes with us, you know, will feel that we are new nuclear weapon state. And, you know, and that breaks the whole logic of the regime down. And that is very dangerous uh, for, for humanity because uh, currently um, the proliferation of nuclear weapons is, of course, limited not only by the regime, but also because the production of uh, nuclear weapons is expensive. But imagine that, you know, in 20 years, there will be some new disruptive techno technologies which allows you to produce a nuclear weapon, you know, with a small... Um, you, you know, in the garage, basically. And and then we, we could get into a very dangerous uh, situation uh, when this nuclear um, uh, non-proliferation regime um, does not function anymore. And we may then get lots of countries with nuclear weapons and all sorts of risks uh, that go, of course, uh, along with this. That is one yeah. argument. Uh, it's a very strong argument. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, this uh, discussion. And uh, I remind uh, everybody that Andreas Umland will give a course uh, at Casa Paleologo on Putin's rewriting of uh, history on the 26th of uh, February, Yes, if I'm not mistaken. So yes, be, yes. Uh, soon. Uh, and uh, be, be prepared for the course. Uh, not you, those who will come, uh, to, uh, who will join the course. There are uh, some uh, interesting books that have been recently published in uh, Romanian, Galeotti. Uh, let's mm -hmm. talk about uh, Putin. There is also the book of uh, Francoise Tom uh, about Putin. Uh, Putin și Putinism, comprendre Putin, um, uh, le Putinism in French, uh, and uh, Timothy Snyder as well, The Road to uh, Unfreedom, uh, Drumul către ne, uh, ne Libertate, was also uh, published uh, in Romanian. Uh, so there are some very interesting books that have been uh, published in Romanian recently. Uh, Andreas, uh, see you soon. Uh, see you on, yes. on the 26th. And thank you again. Thank you very much. And follow uh, with great care everything that happens uh, to our East. And uh, all our sympathies on your side. I mean... <laughs> <laughs>